out. Okay, fine. Sounds good. Uh, shall we go live? We can yeah, start we live can. YouTube streaming. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Sir. And just let me know wherever you want me to begin. Okay, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. I welcome you all to the fifth session of our FDP Come Workshop program. We have Dr. Sharik with us. We have Dr. Sharik with us in this session as an expert speaker. Dr. Sharik is an assistant professor in the Department of Chemical Engineering with specialization in energy process at KTH Royal Institute of Technology, Stockholm, Sweden. Its research mainly revolves around techno-economic analysis of clean energy conversion process. Currently, his research, his research is focused on decarbonizing the industrial sector, hydrogen generation with carbon dioxide capture, and removal of greenhouse gases from air. He obtained his PhD in 2018 in energy and process engineering from NTNU and followed, up, followed it up with a postdoctoral fellow at the same university. Now I request Dr. Sarik Mahmat Najir to deliver his talk. Please, sir. Yeah, thank you, Pratiksha. So, yeah, so Pratiksha has already uh, given a small introduction to me. Uh, sir, first of all, sir, yeah, okay now? Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, hello, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. I think it's, it's already 12 o'clock in India, but but here in Sweden, it's still 8.30. That's what I was referring to, to Pratiksha. It's still not 8.30 in the morning here. Uh, but yeah, so today's talk is about decarbonizing industry. Pratiksha has already given a small introduction to myself, but I'll, I'll do that again. Uh, to, uh, before that, I introduce where I work. I work at uh, KTH Royal Institute of Technology, uh, which was founded, which was founded uh, almost 200 years ago. It's Sweden's largest technical research and learning institution with 13,500 full-time students. Uh, you can see the percentages of, of women and men uh, in, in the students. We have close to 1,700 active research students, 32% are women and 68% men. We have 317 full-time professors. Uh, it could be wasting an adjunct. And 287 associate professors. That also includes the assistant professors like me. Uh, giving a small introduction, the department that I'm located at, uh, it's the chemical engineering department in KTH. It's a part of uh, the CBH school, CBS stands for chemistry, biotechnology and health. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, so, so the department combines fundamental chemical knowledge with engineering tools in order to bring new products and processes into the market. And the work uh, here combines both experimental as well as the advanced modeling studies. Uh, what I do is basically a uh, process modeling and simulation. Uh, we have five divisions in the department uh, focusing on applied electrochemistry, process technology, energy processes, resource recovery, and nuclear waste engineering. Uh, I, I personally work in the energy processes division. Uh, just to give a small background that Pratiksha has already given, I was, I'm was i an assistant professor in the Energy Process Division at, at KTH, the Department of Chemical Engineering at KTH. Before this, I was a postdoctoral fellow at Norwegian University of Science and Technology at one time. Before that, a PhD candidate in the same university. My, my PhD dissertation was, was about uh, techno-economic analysis of combined cycle power plants integrated with chemical looping, reforming, and CO2 capture. So it was mainly focusing on CO2 capture in power plants. Uh, or gas, gas-based power plants. Uh, I worked in India before that uh, as a process development uh, process development manager in Mondelez International, it's a chocolate company, Cadbury, uh, and then I was also a scientist in, in metals uh, department at Aitabila Science and Technology Company. Did both a bachelor's and master's from the Bits Pilani Goa campus. Currently, uh, I'm involved in teaching uh, 
uh, or involved in, in two courses here at KTH. Uh, one course is CO2 neutral energy and transport systems and, and transport phenomena uh, for chemical engineering students. Uh, my main research focus is on clean energy conversion process, decarbonization of industrial sector, hydrogen production and CO2 capture, uh, process intensification, thermodynamic analysis and techno-economic studies, and then developing process and equipment skill models. Uh, I have uh, or I'm involved in two funded projects from the Swedish Energy Agency, uh, one focusing on producing uh, transportation fuels from, from bio biomass and the other focusing on removing multiple greenhouse gases from air, which is closer to the agriculture and farming fields. What I'm going to present today is, uh, uh, is, is about decarbonizing industry and, and my presentation will follow this, this five, uh, five or it will cover these five points today. The first is we'll try to discuss what is the current state of emissions from the industrial sector. Uh, we try understanding uh, decarbonizing the industry uh, from, from, a, from Kaya identity. Uh, we also try to understand the measures and opportunities in different industries. Uh, like hydrogen, ammonia, cement, and steel that I'm going to present here. And we also try to see why it is difficult to decarbonize this industry and how CO2 capture and storage then would be a possible solution for that. And then I introduce the term negative emission technologies to, to end my presentation. So let's start with the first point, which is trying to understand the current state of emissions from the industrial sector. Uh, a lot of you must have come across this graph sometime or the other. The global CO2 uh, atmospheric concentration has passed 400 ppm. It's 484, between 480 and 490 ppm as of today. And this is the graph for the last uh, approximately 2000 years. And we see it has risen from 2000, uh, 280 ppm to 480 to 490 ppm now. Uh, the thing is, a lot of people argue, oh, you know what, this this happens in cycles every 100,000 years. But then if you see the graph for the last uh, 800,000 years, uh, we see that we are, still, we are still way ahead of what it has been in the last 800,000 years. And this is down to the industrial revolution that happened between 1960s and 1970s and, and due to the man-made, and these are basically man-made emissions. If we speak about the global greenhouse gases that has caused that has caused global warming uh, by 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 the different types of gases that have contributed to it, it's the carbon dioxide which is present in atmosphere. Sixty-four percent of it is carbon dioxide uh, from fossil industrial processes. Eleven percent of it coming from forest and other land use. Then we have methane, nitrous oxide contributing the next close to 22%, and then we have fluorine-based gases, 2%. That has drastically come down now uh, in recent years. Uh, if you speak about the global greenhouse gases by the economic sectors, uh, we see that the majority share is the electricity and heat production, which is around 25%, followed by agriculture and forestry, which is 24%. Majority of the emissions from, from agriculture and forest and land use uh, comes from methane and nitrous oxide and less from CO2. Then we have the industry sector contributing 20, 21%. And majority of the emissions from industry sector is, is, is carbon dioxide. Followed by transportation, which is 14%, and then other energy sectors and buildings following that. The focus of this presentation is again on industry, and, and we try to understand what 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 how I define industry, for me, industry would be uh, cement, steel, hydrogen, ammonia in this presentation. Uh, and we will leave the power power sector or the energy sector aside. We see here the, the greenhouse gas emissions, how they have gone up from 1970 to 2010. On the left side of the graph, you see the percentages of each sector. And then on the right side of the graph, you see the percentages of each, of, of each sector. Uh, and also, and also, how much it has gone up, up, up or down? If we speak about cement, which is in orange, you can see uh, on the left side it was 4.8% in 1970. Uh, in 2010, it's around 13% of of the greenhouse gas emissions comes from cement. We see ferrous and non-ferrous 
sector it was 27 percent before it's 22 percent now but, but of course the 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 total emissions are are higher even though the percentage is even though the percentage is lower uh, similarly followed by chemicals it was 13 percent at 1970 15 percent now but again the the in absolute terms the greenhouse gas emissions uh, is is higher than it was in 1970 and it has been on an increasing trend from then until now uh, well these the graph here shows that direct emissions from the industry whereas which if you see on the right side it is total right side on the top you can see total 10 so that is 10 gigaton co2 equivalent per year which is directly emitted by the industry but then what also goes into this apart from the, in addition to, to these emissions is the emissions that come from 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 the use of energy in this industry and that accounts to a total of five another 5.3 gigaton equivalent per year of greenhouse gas emissions if you see if you see that value on the right side of the graph on the top you see another 5.3 gigaton coming uh, as indirect emissions that is coming if you're supplying electricity to the compressors or pumps in the industry for example i mean this this emissions comes from supplying that electricity so basically being emitted in the electrical in in the in the power generation uh, plant well we speak about emissions from these industries, but then if you speak about the growth of, of or, or the amount of uh, main mineral manufacturing products, that is the cement, steel, uh, and ammonia, and, and whatever we are speaking about, it is on an increasing trend. So between 1970 and 2010, we see that cement has has grown up by has the amount of cement being produced uh, has grown by a factor of six and a half approximately if if it was one in 1970 it's 6.5 now the iron ore if it was one in 1970 it is around four right now so it has gone four folds higher whereas nitrogen in the form of ammonia uh, it has gone again three and a half to four folds higher compared to 1970 Similarly, for the other other minerals as well, like copper, silver, they're all on a growing trend. And that means if these are growing, the emissions are also going to grow. So the IEA, the International Energy Agency, has proposed uh, different, uh, uh, different methods now to, to reduce these emissions or to bring down these emissions. Uh, so that the, the total temperature rise uh, at the end of 2100 is not above 200 uh, is not above 2 degrees uh, centigrade so they want to limit the temperature rise to a maximum of 2 degrees by the end of 2100 degrees centigrade and they have presented different uh, methods to 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 achieve that uh, and to do that we'll have to reduce the, the we'll have to reduce the amount of co2 being emitted from different sectors uh, how can it be done is by integrating renewables so renewables are going to contribute by 35%. If we are going to limit the temperature rise to two degrees uh, centigrade, according to the IE International Energy Agency, carbon capture and storage will contribute to 14% of it. Fuel switching will contribute to 5%. Efficiency improvements in the processes and the technologies will contribute to, by around 40%. And then integrating nuclear will contribute to 66%. But this is again, um, all these percentages are for reaching a target of, of maximum two degree rise in, in the temperature. But then if you're, uh, if you want to be more ambitious and if you want to limit the temperature, global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees, we need to accelerate our efforts in that the renewables are going to contribute. The, you can see the percentages on the right. Your carbon capture and storage need to contribute higher. That means we'll have to take immediate actions to, to, to achieve this 1.5 degree target. So let us start understanding uh, what do we mean by decarbonization of industry and at, at the basic level using the Kaya identity. Now, if we have to define the Kaya identity, it was defined by a Japanese scientists, Kaya, and uh, 
it says the global CO2 emissions per year, which is F, is equal is is a factor of population P. It's the factor of gross domestic product. It's the factor of primary energy consumption, which is E. Now, if if I go to the next slide, we can understand it in in, in a much better manner. We have the population on the right. That is the 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 total emissions is a factor of population. It's a factor of gross domestic product divided by the population, which is definition of standard of living, and it also uh, it also includes the amount of material uh, each person uses. So in developed countries, people use a lot of material per person. In developing countries, it is on an increasing trend, whereas in the underdeveloped countries, it is much lower. The energy use per GDP is the amount of energy you are putting in to producing the materials that is used by the population. So, so that is the definition of energy intensity. So the amount of energy you put in to produce anything. Whereas the climate gas emissions by energy on the left side is the is basically a reflection of the technology and the energy sources. That is the amount of emissions uh, you're going to have for the energy use. So the amount of emissions you're going to have for the energy use, the energy you're using to produce certain materials, and the amount of materials you're using based per person in, 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 in any country or anywhere in the world, and then multiplying it with the population. So all these factors go, go into the total amount of emissions you're going to have. So we can play around with this. Either we limit the population growth to control the emissions, either we limit the amount of material we can use per person to limit the amount of emissions. In the middle, uh, when we speak about energy intensity, either we improve the efficiency of the processes so that the amount of energy being used to produce certain materials is low, or we can reduce the amount of emissions for using that much amount of energy. But then if we, if we put all the values, of, if we put the current values in, in the Kaya identity, and if we speak about where we will reach, currently we are at 480 to 490 ppm. We would reach with the current rates of each of this uh, factor in this equation, we would be around 720 to to 750 ppm of uh, CO2 in the atmosphere by the end of 2100. And that means uh, we are speaking about a temperature rise of, uh, I think, five to six degrees, if I'm not wrong, or, or, or more than that. So, but then we don't want this. So we want to accelerate of our efforts to, to keep the temperature rise below two degrees by the end of 2100. So then we need to accelerate of our efforts in either reducing the amount of material that we use per person or trying to improve efficiency as much as we can for the process or reduce the emissions for, for those processes that we're speaking about. Now, as a chemical engineer, I would focus on the first two aspects, which is the technology and the energy resources and the energy intensity, because standard of living is something that is not within, it's not in my hands, nor the population growth, of course. It's very limited though. Well, uh, when we speak about the material flows in, in the European Union, uh, we have a total of, of more than 400 metric tons per year of flow of cement, steel, and chemicals in EU, and that's why the focus is more on cement and steel, followed by ammonia. And when I speak about ammonia, ammonia is important because with the growing rate of population, you need to, you need to have that much amount of food available for the population. And if you don't have ammonia in the mix, you cannot produce that much amount of food that is required to feed the population. So more than 400, uh, more, more than 400 million tons per year uh, flow of cement, steel, and chemicals in the European Union. Uh, we speak about cement. One kg of cement produces nearly 0.7 kg of CO2, or it emits 0.7 kg of CO2. Producing one, steel, uh, one kg of steel will emit around 2 kg of CO2. Uh, plastic product, uh, plastic industries emits nearly 4.6 kgs of CO2 per kg of plastic. And all this results 
and 536 million tons per year of CO2 emissions in the European Union. This is according to 2015 standards. So 400 million tons flow of this material results in 536 million tons CO2 emissions. Uh, what they predict in the 2050 uh, pathways of decarbonizing industry in the European Union, uh, if you read the, the report material economics, uh, is that your emissions are going to increase only. Like, first of all, th there's an increased growth of production of this, uh, of this material. Cement production is going to increase. Steel production is going to increase. The chemicals production is going to increase. And that will account to an increase in the amount of CO2 by around 62, 62 million tons per year. So we go from 536 plus 62. Then we are going to incinerate the plastics. That is going to cause another 68 uh, million tons per year of CO2 being emitted. So we are 536 plus 62 plus 68. Uh, all the efficiency improvements that have been planned in the European Union will account to reducing 43 million tons per year of CO2. And then if you are going to decarbonize the power sector by, in, by integrating renewables into the mix, we are, going to, uh, we are going to reduce 77 million tons per year of, uh, of CO2 further. But even after all that, all the efforts of improving the efficiency and decarbonizing the power sector, we would still end up with 545 million tons per year of CO2 being emitted from the industrial sector. So what is the reason? The, the industrial sector, if you speak about the emissions from the industrial sector, and if you divide where does it come from, from the electricity uh, that you supply to the industries, it's around 64, uh, 64, uh, 64 million tons. When we speak uh, the low and mid temperature heat processes emit around 22 million tons of CO2. The end of life treatment uh, for different materials emits 59 million tons of CO2 per year. The high temperature processes like steel, cement, uh, they produce uh, nearly 143 million tons of, uh, of uh, CO2 per year. And, and the process emissions uh, from the process itself in the industrial sector emits around 248 million tons of, uh, of CO2. And if you see, uh, if you see this pie, the 84% the of these emissions is actually very hard to abate because we cannot go away from high temperature heat. We cannot go away from process emissions and we cannot go away from end of life treatment. So we have to deal with it. We can, of course, the electricity that we supply can come through renewables. So that becomes decarbonized. The low and mid temperature heat can be decarbonized, but then the other parts is, is still very hard to abate. So let us see what are the possible options or, or how we can start abating this 84%. And I start off with, with, with cement. And, and to start off with cement, we first need to understand how cement is produced. So we have the raw materials, uh, which is a combination of calcium carbonate, Ca, calcium CaCO3. We have silica, alumina, and iron oxide present in the, in the raw material, uh, which is on the left. It is crushed. It is blended, it is dried, and then it is fed, uh, and then it is fed to the clinker, where it is calcinated. So cal calcination is nothing but your calcium carbonate dissociating into calcium oxide and CO2. So after that, it is this forms clinker. This clinker is stored. It is ground, and then cement is cement is basically prepared uh, after grinding the clinker. So when you speak about cement, the composition of cement is on the right side, which has 63% uh, calcium oxide. So the major step here is, is, is the calcination step, which happens in the plane. So what we have here is the cyclone preheater. You feed your, you feed your, your material here, and then you have a, yeah, I can use the mouse. Yeah, so so you have the material coming in here. The, the, the raw meal that enters here gets heated up. And then here is a rotary cling where this reaction happens. That is the calcium carbonate dissociated in calcium oxide and CO2. The temperature that is required in the rotary cling is around 1,400 degrees centigrade. This reaction to happen. And it requires fuels of 20 megajoule per kg or higher LHV. So we are speaking about coal. Uh, coal or methane, 
people are testing hydrogen here these days, but but we are speaking about coal and methane basically. And and majority of the clinkers uh, use uh, a majority of the kins use use coal these days, and they are trying to have a mix of bio bio based fuels and coal here. Now, uh, as we see here, sixty percent of the CO two comes from the process itself. That is from dissociating ca calcium carbonate into calcium oxide and CO two. So, so this CO two is coming from the process chemistry and not from burning the fuel. Whereas the remaining forty percent of the emissions comes from the combustion of fuels in in the in the in the kin. So, so we cannot go away from dissociating calcium carbonate. So we have to deal with this CO2, that is 60% of CO2 coming from the process. But then this 40% is something that we can play around with. But again, we can play around it to an extent because we still need fuels with higher, lower heating value. If we speak about the technology that, that, that we saw in the picture, uh, it is Calcina, five-stage cyclone preheater, modern grade clinker, we have clinker production of 1 million tons per year, cement production 1.36 million tons per year. The fuel consumption is 69% fossil fuel, which is basically coal, 26% alternative fuels, and biomass 4.5%. We need so much electricity required, 349 megajoule per ton of cement. Indirect CO2 emissions from electricity is, you can, so it's around 49 to 68 uh, kgs per, per, per ton cement, and then total CO2 emissions is is around 660 to 680 uh, kgs per, per ton cement, or 0 0.66, 0 0.68 tons CO2 per ton cement. Now, when we speak about decarbonizing and different options the, uh, of, of reducing the amount of uh, CO2 emissions, uh, the, the IEA GHG report, which is the International Energy Agency Greenhouse Gas Program, so reported in, in their report, deployment of CCS in cement industry, about different options of reducing the emissions from cement process. So what they suggest here is, I mean, we just focus on this one, which is the direct CO2 reduction. And this is the indirect CO2 reduction. When we speak about direct CO2 reduction, it is directly from the process. And when we speak about indirect, it is also from the electricity. Now, when we saw here, we are, we are speaking about 660 to 680 kgs of CO2 per, per ton cement. But then if you convert that to clinker, it would be a little more higher around uh, 700 to, to 800 kgs per CO2. So we basically need to reduce that 800 or around 700 to 800 kgs per ton, ton clinker in the process. Now, when you speak here, those numbers, when we are speaking about 700 to 800, we can see changing from long clins to preheater, pre kyle cyanide clins, basically changing the, changing the kind of technology itself. We might go down between 80 to 250 kgs of CO2 in the process. Whereas you see all the other options, pre to modification, not much change of CO2 reductions. Efficient clinker cooler technologies, very less, 9 to 28 kgs of CO2, which is again very less compared to the target that we have around 700 to 800 kgs. The additional preheater, 6 to 8. Oxygen enrichment technology, we could decrease up to 170. So this is a major uh, impact, but again, this will require changes in, in the equipment because it, ha it has to withstand the oxygen enriched air, whereas the other options still very less, 15 to 20, 27. Speak about uh, the process efficiency, the other process efficiency improvement options, none, but then indirect CO2 reduction, again, very little, seven to 11 kgs, two to three kgs, one to two kgs, one to five kgs, not much enough. We speak about fuel switching options in, in, this, in the cement plant. If you replace the fossil fuel, uh, coal with, with biomass, for example, we could decrease between 80 to 200 kgs per uh, uh, kg CO2 per ton clinker. And as we discussed, the oxygen enrichment might help. But when we speak about fossil fuel replacement with biomass, uh, we are able to decrease the CO2 because the CO2 emitted from biogenic sources is considered neutral in the atmosphere. So yet again, I mean, if we start implementing all these options, we would still find it difficult to reach the 700 to 800 kgs per ton clinker 
target that we need to reduce, that we need to decarbonize in, in the cement plant. And if you start implementing all these options, the amount of changes that we need to do in the technology itself and the processes itself would be very high. Yeah, again, using alternative raw materials, again, very less impact on the total CO2 that will be that will be uh, reduced. If you go into steel making and options to decarbonize, I know there are plenty of people here who might be who might be uh, experts in in steel production, uh, and I'm not. Uh, I just deal with the uh, with the flue gases from from steel and not uh, not with the steel process itself. So in steel, you have uh, the, the iron ore needs to be treated to produce hot roll coil steel. We have 66 uh, percent, yeah, around 66 percent. Uh, in this ore, for example, iron, and we need to go to 98.73. It's basically in the form of iron oxides. So your iron oxides need to be reduced to iron, and you do that with with, with, the, with the reducing agent, and that is coal uh, in in the steel plant, coke, uh, coke, sorry, in the steel plant. So you have, uh, if you just try understanding the process, we have iron ore and limestone, which is sintered is fed to the blast furnace along with uh, coal which is passed through the coke ovens and then fed into the blast furnace along with the ore to reduce the ore the ore gets reduced to around 93 94 percent iron and that is passed on to the blast the basic oxygen furnace where you supply oxygen to oxidize the other other met other metals that have been formed for example silicon and manganese so you form uh, sio2 and, and manganese oxide and a bit of iron also goes into iron oxide form, but then majority of the iron remains here, and then this is around 98% to 99% iron. This is taken into ladle, and then it is continuously casted in the form you want. Uh, the electric arc furnace, you basically melt uh, the scrap in the electric arc furnace, uh, and, and in the other technologies, we also put the pig iron in the electric arc, uh, sorry, we put the direct produced iron in the electric arc furnace. Now we see that we are using, we are basically using coal in the process here to reduce the iron ore. Now to the, what happens here is the, we see the emissions uh, we discussed before, nearly two ton CO2 or yeah, just 2000 kgs, uh, CO2 per ton of uh, steel that is being produced. It's a very similar number here. And majority of the emissions comes from the, uh, from the flue gas from the coke oven, uh, from, the, from the coke ovens. It comes from the sintering plant. Uh, then it comes from the hot stuffs, which is nothing but the blast furnace and the blast oxygen furnace. We have majority of the emissions, 25% of it, close to 25%. And then we have uh, and then we have the power plant uh, of of the steel that is emitting uh, that is emitting nearly half of the CO2 that is emitted from the steel plant. Uh, to reduce the emissions in in the steel plant, uh, this, this another technology called a direct reduced iron technology, which uses natural gas instead of coal to reduce the iron ore. So your natural gas reduces the, the iron ore that is fed from the top, and then that forms uh, that forms sponge iron, and that sponge iron is fed to the electric arc furnace. Now, this has been clearly seen even in power plants that a shift from coal to natural gas reduces the amount of CO2 emissions per, per, uh, per, per, for, 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 the, for the same amount of energy output. Again, using natural gas here reduces the amount of CO2 emissions in the steel making process, itself, uh, process as well. I'm not going to go too much into the technology itself here. But then if you speak about the two technologies, that is a blast furnace, and, and that is a blast furnace technology to produce steel and the direct reduced iron technology that we just saw. The amount of CO2 emissions in the blast furnace technology was around two tons CO2 per ton of uh, steel, whereas reduces by a factor of half in, in the direct reduced iron technology and DRA technology. It's just about one ton CO2 per ton 
steel. When we start melting scrap, uh, nearly 70% of the steel is produced from scrap and 30% coming from, uh, from, from the ore. We see that there is further reduction in the total CO2 emitted. And then if you are just melting scrap, we, we emit very less CO2. And this is the scenario of the future because uh, uh, because uh, because the, the steel market is going to get saturated and then it will be more about recycling scrap to produce more steel. But still, we have nearly five tons CO2 per ton per ton uh, steel that is being produced, even from the scrap. Now, th there is this, uh, this new technology that is being tested in Sweden uh, in, in a project called Hybrid, where we are getting, we are going away from the blast furnace technology and to the direct reduced iron technology, but in conventional direct reduced iron technology, we use methane to reduce the iron ore, but in Sweden, they are taking trials to use hydrogen to reduce the iron ore. So you have iron ore pellets that go into the direct reduced uh, iron furnace where your hydrogen reduces the iron ore, forms sponge iron, and that sponge iron is again melted in the electric arc furnace along with scrap to produce steel. Now, the plan is to produce hydrogen from uh, fossil free electricity through electrolysis and store the hydrogen and then use the hydrogen continuously in the furnace. Very ambitious project, it's, but it has been told recently that it might take another 10 to 15 years for this project to, to come into reality. But the pilot scale trials are, are ongoing right now. So, so this would basically decarbonize the, the, the steel industry in totality because here you don't see any carbonaceous source that is going into the process. So you have fossil free electricity producing hydrogen, that hydrogen being used in the process to reduce the iron ore. Uh, as we see here, uh, so, so hydrogen basically forms uh, one of the major components in, 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 decarbonizing, in decarbonizing in the future. Now, when you speak about decarbonization, uh, there are two things that are always going to be spoken about. One is hydrogen, the other is, the other is electrification. Now, in transport sector, you, you can clearly see that using electric uh, vehicles reduces the the uh, the reduce, reduces the, the emissions from the cars. Of course, uh, it depends what the electrical source is for that for that electricity that you using if that you're using in the cars. So, if it is fossil free electricity that is being used in the cars, then of course you are kind of de decarbonizing the transport sector. So, so electrification is one way to decarbonize. The other way to decarbonize is, is using hydrogen. Uh, now, when we speak about hydrogen, hydrogen production takes place from steam methane reforming. Around uh, around 75% of hydrogen that is produced in the world it comes from steam methane reforming, that is reforming of natural gas. So you have natural gas going through the steam methane reforming process to produce hydrogen and carbon dioxide. Basic reactions are your methane, and steam react endothermically. That is, you need to supply heat for this reaction to happen to form CO and 3H2. Your carbon monoxide reacts with steam to form carbon dioxide and hydrogen. This is the water gas shift reaction, uh, which is exothermic in nature. But then I've put it in a very simple form here. If you speak about the process itself, it looks a bit like this, where your natural gas is is desulfurized, pre-reformed, reformed into syngas. Your syngas uh, is cooled and then goes to the water gas shift step and cooled again to produce pure hydrogen. And then this off gas is used in the burner to supply heat in the steam methane reforming process. Uh, I would recommend you to go through this paper and I think you will understand the process in detail there. Uh, but then ju just speaking about uh, uh, but then we, there are several ways of uh, of improving the efficiency of, of we have proposed another tech another process to to improve the efficiency of, of this steam methane reforming process and ha also have inherent co2 capture in, in the process now a conventional steam methane reformer you see here the 
the amount of uh, CO2 that you uh, that you emit is around 71 uh, gram CO2 per megajoule of uh, of thermal energy input to the process, whereas the process that we are working on, which is gas fishing reforming, you can reduce it up to 11 gram CO2 per megajoule. Again, I would recommend you to go through the papers that we have published in this to understand the process a bit more. But then, yeah, we'll speak about carbon capture and storage in a while, but then there are different different processes that could be developed, but then it brings a complete shift in the technology to actually go down from, from 71 to, to 11.4 uh, gram CO2 emitted per megajoule of thermal energy input. Uh, we speak about ammonia production from steam methane reforming and autothermal reforming. Uh, here we have uh, we have the natural gas. It's very similar to the hydrogen production process. You have the natural gas desulfurized pre-reformed. So in the fire tubular reactor, it's it, the endothermic steam methane reforming happening here. So you need to supply heat. So to supply heat, you basically burn more fuel, and that fuel uh, uh, gets combusts and forms flue gas, and that is emitted from the fire tubular reactor here. The syngas goes further, gets reformed uh, further, goes to the water gas shift steps. You remove the CO2 from the process. So there are two different CO2 streams in the ammonia production. One CO2 stream is from the process itself. And the other one is coming from the fuel uh, that you burn to provide heat here. So one is one, uh, one CO2 emission. Uh, so the CO2 emissions comes from the fuel that you burn and from the process itself. So you remove CO2. Now what we notice is that two thirds of the costs of the full CCS chain, which is carbon capture and storage chain, comes from the CO2 capture section. And that's why majority of the research has been focused on, on identifying the suitable capture process. There are three ways of, of capturing CO2. One is a post-combustion, the other is pre-combustion, and the third one is oxy-fuel combustion. Uh, when we speak about post-combustion, you have the fuel with air. Uh, yeah, we, we speak uh, in, in power plant conventions. You have the flue gas being formed when you combust the fuel with air. So in this flue gas, you have other components as well. You separate the CO2, that is, you capture the CO2 after the fuel has been combusted, and then you keep that CO2 for compression, transport, and storage. In pre-combustion, what happens is you have fuel and you have air. You pa partially oxidize the fuel to form syngas. It goes through a water gas shift to form hydrogen and carbon dioxide. So the fuel has not yet been combusted. It has formed. It has been converted basically from whatever uh, the, the original fuel was to, to hydrogen. And then you have a CO2, you separate the CO2 uh, from this mixture to a CO2 capture section. So you have clean hydrogen, and then you have CO2 being captured, which could be compressed, transported, and stored. And then you have the hydrogen as the fuel now that reacts with air uh, in a power plant uh, to, pr to produce a flue gas, which is free of CO2. So therefore, this route is called a pre-combustion route because you, before the fuel is being combusted, you are removing the CO2 from it. Whereas here in the post-combustion route, you are combusting the fuel with air and then removing the CO2 from the flue gas, whereas here you're not doing that. Whereas the oxy-combustion route is pretty straightforward. What you do here is instead of uh, separating CO2 from the flue gas, what you do is you separate oxygen from air. That is, you, you, you have an air separation unit which separates oxygen and nitrogen and you use the pure oxygen to combust the fuel. So if it is a coal-based power plant, for example, you have C, that is just carbon reacting with O2 to form CO2. If you have natural gas-based uh, power plants, you have CH4 plus, uh, plus O2 forming CO2 plus H2O. And then you get a clean uh, stream of CO2 and H2O. You condense the H2O part, just with condensation, you are left with CO2 alone. So, so this is the oxy combustion route. In the industrial process, you have the fuel, you have the raw material, uh, 
and then you have the flue gases, you have a CO2 capture section in the industrial process to capture the CO2 from the flue gases and the product, and then that CO2 could be, again, compressed transport and storage. So when we speak about uh, the industrial process that we spoke about here, which is cement, steel, and ammonia, for example, we are speaking about post-combustion, uh, we are speaking about, uh, in steel and, uh, and cement, we are speaking about post-combustion capture because you are completely combusting the fuel to CO2, and then you're removing the CO2 from flue gases. <coughs> Similarly, in ammonia as well, because in, in ammonia, as we just go back and see, you're combusting the fuel here in the in the in the in the reformer, and this flue gas uh, is having CO2, and this CO2 is is being removed from the flue gas after combustion. So it, again, you need to apply a post-combustion method. Now, there are different ways of capturing the CO2. Again, now when you speak about post-combustion, pre-combustion, and, and air separation unit, we have absorption, adsorption, cryogenic distillation, membranes, gas hydrates, and chemical looping. There, these are different ways of, uh, of uh, capturing CO2 from the flue gases. Now, absorption is the most mature technology. Uh, it's been, it has been deployed commercially in two plants around the world. Uh, so yeah, whereas the other technologies are being researched, uh, even though their technology readiness level has reached up to the pilot scale level, still not commercial yet in terms of CO2 capture. Now, when we speak about the different conditions in the CO2 capture routes, I mean, uh, different conditions define different types of technologies that needs to be used. So, uh, your CO2 concentrations in the flue gas, the temperature of the flue gas, the pressure and the impurities in the flue gas actually determine uh, the, the kind of CO2 capture technology that you should use. And in that particular technology, the kind of uh, the kind of solvents you need to use. So <coughs> even in pre-combustion, post-combustion capture routes, the amount of, uh, if, we, if we have to compare, the amount of CO2 in the pre-combustion capture route uh, is pretty high. Whereas the amount of CO2 in the post-combustion capture route is pretty low compared to pre-combustion. So basically the partial pressure of CO2, if you see here, 38 mole percent, whereas the pressure is 30 bar in pre-combustion. So this would be around nine bar partial pressure of CO2. Whereas here in the post-combustion, we have 10 to 15 per, uh, percent by mole of CO2 in the flue gas, one bar pressure of the stream. So that would be around 0.1 to 0.15 bar partial pressure of CO2. So here in post-combustion capture routes, we have 0.1 to 0.2 bar partial pressure of CO2. Pre-combustion, you have moderate partial pressures of CO2. Could be more than three, could be more than four. So that determines the kind of technology, the kind of solvent you need to use to capture the CO2. Uh, the conventional process uh, in the post-combustion capture route is, is using uh, is using uh, chemical absorption uh, using amines. Uh, most mature technology uh, is, is chemical absorption. What you have here is is the flue gas which has CO2 entering into the absorber. You have the solvent that goes in here, which is basically amines that is being tested, and that amine captures the CO2 when it comes in this absorber. So you have the flue gas going up, you have the solvent coming down. In this, you have amine. So this amine captures the CO2, it comes down. So this amine is coming down along with the CO2, whereas the remainder of the flue gas, which is which is which which uh, which doesn't have CO2 now, is is going into the exhaust. So it basically have nitrogen and, and a bit of steam and, and a bit of oxygen, whereas the remainder uh, the CO2 is being captured by this amine. So this rich CO2 amine, that is the amine having the CO2, comes down and it goes into the dissolver. So in dissolver, what you do is you supply heat to, to release the CO2 that was captured in the, in the amine here. So you have the amine with CO2 coming in here, pumped, sent to the stripper or the regenerator. In this, you supply heat either in the form of steam or in the form of heat itself, and then that releases the CO2 in the form of gas and that CO2 is then compressed and then made ready for transport and storage. Whereas the amine uh, from which the CO2 has been released is again taken down from the stripper uh, 
and then it is recirculated back in the absorber to capture the CO2 that is coming again in the fuel gas. So this technology is the most mature technology. The, the, the advantage of technology is that it's lower cost, high chemical reactivity can easily be retrofitted to, to the plant. As you see, you have the flue gas coming here, so you do not have to change the process itself, uh, like cement or steel. Whatever flue gases that are coming out of this uh, process, you could directly feed into this absorber from here. So, so it is you could easily retrofit this plant, this CO two capture plant, to to any industrial process. The the problems with this technology is that the regeneration energy requirement that is here in the stripper to regenerate this amine this rich amine that was going into the stripper to regenerate that amine so that it can be used again in the absorber. So in the reboiler, you spend a lot of energy. Then there is always a problem of solvent degradation. There have been reports that uh, this um, amines uh, from aerosols in air when, when they go into the exhaust gas, some of the amines uh, yeah, go into the air and then they form aerosols, which is again creating uh, environment problems and also they, they corrode the equipment. But of course, we are able to remove 90% of the CO2 from the flue gases, at least. Uh, again, when we speak about the kind of solvents and that depends on the partial pressures of CO2, so higher partial pressures favors different types of solvents, lower partial pressures of CO2 favors another type of solvents. We spoke about the chemical, uh, chemical absorption here, so we are dealing with chemical so, uh, solvents, that is amine-based solvents. So we would use chemical absorption when the partial pressure is low. So here the partial pressure in the post-combustion capture process is very low. It's between, it's less than one bar because the flue gas is coming at one bar. So a partial pressure, pressure of CO2 is always less than one bar. And that's why we prefer the chemical absorption process because the partial pressure is low. Uh, there are two different terms that we speak about when we speak about carbon uh, CO2 capture. One is the, the CO2 capture percentage, which is directly the CO2 captured from the process divided by the CO2 that was generated from the process that was there in the flue gas. The other term is the CO2 avoidance. So in CO2 avoidance, we basically compare the process that you have with CO2 capture and you compare the process, the reference process that was without CO2 capture. So therefore, the, the CO2 em emissions uh, from the reference plant, which is going to be high, which doesn't have CO2 capture, uh, sorry, CO2 emitted by the reference plant, which doesn't have CO2 capture, then CO2 emitted by the process, which has CO2 capture, which is around 10% approximately, divided by the CO2 emitted by the reference plant without CO2 capture. So the avoidance term is with reference is to, it is with, reference to the reference plant. So you have a plant with capture, you have a plant without capture. So you, you are comparing the plant with capture to the plant without capture. And, and these two terms are very common when you deal with CO2 capture process. So as I was speaking uh, before, uh, you have the cement making process. You don't have to change anything in the process Whatever flue gases you have, you directly take it to the CO2 capture plant. You have the absorber that, that captures the CO2, takes it to the desorber, you release the CO2 here, and then this CO2 is made ready for transport and storage. You just have to have this heat input, either in the form of steam or directly heat. So you could easily retrofit this process to the cement plant. Uh, what happens if you do that, uh, we can see here. So the direct CO2 emissions that we were speaking about, the reference plant was having 846 kg per ton of clinker uh, CO2 emissions. Whereas if you include a capture plant to this, to the, to, if you include a capture, if you retrofit a capture plant in a cement plant, you see 90% of the CO2 is captured and it is made ready for storage underground. Whereas you only emit 84 kgs per ton of uh, clinker. Whereas this, jump from 846 kgs per ton of clinker to 84 kgs per ton of clinker wouldn't have been possible if we were not using carbon capture and storage without disturbing the core process itself. The other way around is to come up with a new technology which doesn't which doesn't emit this much amount of CO2. But then if you want to re if you want to reduce the emissions immediately without changing the technology without 
uh, changing the core process, then CO2 capture is, is a looks a possible solution. But of course, the, the amount of uh, energy input go, goes up because we see here we have to consume uh, more natural gas in the capture plant, which is on the right, uh, to provide heat to regenerate the amine. What happens in terms of costs, uh, what happens is your, uh, your cost to the clinker for the reference plant was 62.6 euros per ton of clinker. This is without CO2 capture, but then with CO2 capture, your cost to the clinker then becomes 107.4 euros per ton clinker, so which is nearly a 50% jump in the cost of clinker being produced. Now, this could only be offset if you impose a CO2 tax. So if you start imposing a CO2 tax on the reference plant, which is emitting CO2, then this cost would go up because they have to pay for the emissions as well. But since the CO2 tax mechanisms are pretty weak these days, the, the cost of the, the, the clinker, for example, is just 62.6 euros per ton clinker, even though they are emitting around 846 kgs per ton clinker. Uh, yeah, we see here this is the cost of CO2 avoided again. Let's see what happens if we if we include a CO2 capture plant in in the steel in, in the steel plant in the steel process. So the reference steel mill, uh, your uh, price of uh, the, the hot roll uh, steel coil was five hundred seventy five dollars per ton. Uh, you include a post combustion capture. In, in the steel plant with just 50.2% 50, 50 capture. Uh, so this is basically the, the, the blast furnace and the power plant. If you are capturing the CO2 from there, you come up with a price of hot roll coil, which increases by around uh, 25 to $75 per ton of, of steel that is being produced. Whereas if you include the, the sintering plant as well, that you want to capture the CO2 from the flue gases from the sintering plant. So that accounts, so you are doing it from sintering plant, from blast furnace and from the power plant, then you end up with 60.4% uh, of CO2 avoided and not captured. So this is avoided CO2. And the, the cost of the hot roll coil uh, goes up by hundred dollars per ton of uh, per ton of uh, hot roll coil. We see here there's a twenty percent increase in the cost if you have sixty point four percent of CO two avoided from the steel plant. But again, you could directly retrofit the, this this capture plant with the steel plant without changing the blast furnace technology, without changing the process, without changing the process chemistry. You could just retrofit the plant, but then there's going to be an increase in the cost. But again, if there are proper CO2 tax mechanisms in place, this, this would be very different. Then even the reference steel mill cost, the, the, the cost of hot oil coal from the reference steel mill would also be very high and would be closer to, to this. So when we speak about CO2 avoidance cost, if you are having $81 per ton of CO2, basically if the CO2 tax is $81 per ton CO2, then the cost of uh, hot oil coil from the plant with capture and the plant without capture would be the same. We speak about ammonia. I'm not going to speak about the cost, but then just uh, with just the but just the specific uh, CO2 emissions. We were emitting uh, 1.5 tons, uh, 1.5 tons of CO2 uh, in an ammonia plant without CO2 capture, but then having a CO2 capture plant in place. You could go down by 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 one third in the amount of uh, CO2 emissions from the plant. Again, if you want to uh, want to check the, the costs of, uh, of of doing this, uh, yeah, I would recommend you to, to refer to one of our recent publications on producing ammonia in membrane-assisted orthothermal reforming process. Now we have spoken about CO2 capture until now. As, as one way to, to decarbonize. But what we also see is that hydrogen in the future could, could actually act as a key in flexible energy systems, especially where there is a possibility of integrating renewables into the energy system. That is where your hydrogen 
could be used as a key to 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 enable uh, to enable the decarbonized energy system. And I'll and I'll take an example of 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 a power plant here because of the electrical power plant. Now, when we just speak about renewables in the sustainable development scenario, uh, the if you speak about uh, yeah, if you speak about the emissions needs to go down in the sustainable development scenario. That is a gram CO two per kilowatt hour. This is for electricity, so it has to go down in the sustainable development scenario drastically. Whereas the share of renewables need to increase in the sustainable development scenario, low carbon solutions need to increase. Whereas the fossil fuels use of fossil fuels needs needs to go down for electricity generation. Now this is this is also supported with a drop in prices of of uh, of the renewable electricity. Like we speak about solar volt uh, solar photovoltaic uh, prices, it has gone down by by, by threefold. Whereas uh, I think the wind power is also is also on 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 the reducing trend. So the costs of electricity from renewables is going down. So the share of renewables in the electricity mix is going to increase, <clears throat> but there's a but there's there's a problem of intermittency of of the renewables, and hydrogen could be that key to actually unlock uh, the the challenges with uh, with with intermittency of renewables. So you have a fossil fuel uh, plant with uh, with CO two capture. You have natural gas, for example, which is a fossil fuel here. You convert natural gas into hydrogen, and you have CO two being produced in the process, so that CO two could be captured, transported, and stored. You generate electricity from this plant, so that is providing electricity, and you have the variable renewables that is being integrated into this electrical grid. So, in times of uh, higher uh, higher share of renewables, the amount of hydrogen that is combusted in in the gas turbine in the plant in the in the power plant can be low producing electricity but then you could keep producing the same amount of hydrogen steadily and you can keep storing the hydrogen so when the share of renewables decreases you increase you take this hydrogen out you combust it produce electricity to compensate for the reduction in the amount of variable renewables into the into the electrical grid how hydrogen helps in this process is because you can keep producing hydrogen from the fossil fuels so you have a steady flow of fossil fuel input to the plant. You keep producing hydrogen. You have the steady, the, the same amount of CO2 being captured, transported, and stored. So there is no variation in the CO2 capture section. There is no variation in the process itself in, the, in, in this fossil fuel conversion plant. The only variation comes in the amount of hydrogen you're storing and you're combusting. Because and that is to compensate for the variable, the intermittency of the variable renewables. And again, we we have uh, we, we have a publication on this. And if you are interested, you could you could have a look. What we do is we 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 uh, we convert natural gas into hydrogen, uh, and, and we also capture CO two. And we present cases where we have uh, fifty percent of variable uh, variable renewables coming into the electricity grid, and fifty percent of electricity coming from hydrogen, uh, hydrogen with CO two capture, of course. And and what is the levelized cost of electricity in in different cases, in different scenarios? With this, I would also like to introduce the term negative emission technologies, which is very common in 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 countries like Sweden, for example. So uh, as as I mentioned earlier co2 being emitted from the biogenic sources is considered neutral in the atmosphere and if you are going to capture that co2 which was already neutral in the atmosphere capture it transport and store it then that co2 that has been captured which was neutral becomes uh, like the overall thing becomes a negative emission process because your co2 was coming from biomass it was being converted in the in 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 any process, this CO2 that was being emitted to the atmosphere was a neutral CO2, but that has been captured now and stored. So you are having a negative emission. So it's basically accelerating the the accelerating the targets, the uh, accelerating 
the the pathway uh, accelerating the the goals basically or, or achieving the goals the pathways to achieving the goals so there are two negative emission technologies that have been studied until now or are being, or under focus one is your bioenergy carbon capture and storage that we discussed just now so whatever co2 is emitted by, by using biogenic sources you try to capture that and store it and then the other method that has recently captured the eye is the direct air capture that is removing uh, uh, removing CO2 from air directly. Uh, what we are doing in our group is, is we are also focusing on removing methane and nitrous oxide then. Uh, so that because this technology that is direct air capture technology to remove CO2 is, is very costly. It's I think 10 times more costlier than, than the CO2 capture from this point sources in, in the plants. In, in industrial plants or, or power plants, but then removing CO2 from, from air is very costly because the concentrations of CO2 in the air is very low. It's from 480 to 480 to 490 ppm compared to, when I say low, low compared to the concentration of CO2 in, in the flue gases of the plants, of the process plants, which is in percentages, whereas in air it's in ppm level. So the cost of removing CO2 from air is very high. It's 10 fold to 15 fold than the cost of uh, removing CO2 from the flue gases. To bring this per ton per ton CO2 equivalent cost down, we have proposed a project where we also focus on removing methane and nitrous oxide from air, which is closer to agriculture and farming fields because the majority of the methane and, nit uh, and nitrous oxide emissions come from agriculture and farming sector. But yeah, I just wanted to introduce this term because uh, these two terms are, are very common here. Uh, just uh, my final reflections on the International Energy Report uh, called CCS Energy and Climate Scenarios 2019 that was released. Uh, it just says that if you don't have carbon uh, CO2 capture and storage in the future energy scenario, the global final energy demand needs to be reduced by 40% along with increased energy efficiency. Now, keeping in mind the population rise along with economic activity, this just doesn't look a realistic scenario. So it's very difficult to reduce the total energy demand to 40%. Now we speak about our daily lives. If we have to go down in the use of energy by 40%, and when we speak about use of energy, it's just not electricity. So it's it's about using it's using the, the, the transport, uh, using the transport that we use, so reducing that by 40%, using the electricity by 40%, using the materials that you consume by 40%. It looks, it doesn't look realistic. So if you don't have CCS, then you need to do that. Uh, uh, carbon capture for fossil fuels and, uh, is, is targeted until mid-century, but then we'll have to focus on carbon capture and storage from the bio-based fuels, which will account as negative emissions. That will be a good way forward. Uh, without carbon capture and storage, the future energy scenario, the cost of limiting temperature rise below 2 degrees would be 138% higher than having CCS miss. So the cost also to achieve the, the climate targets would be higher if you don't have carbon capture and storage in the energy mix in the future. Whereas decarbonizing the industry, especially chemicals, cement, iron and steel without carbon capture and storage is nearly impossible as we have seen because the CO2 is just not coming from the flue gases by burning the fuels, but it, it also comes from the process chemistry itself. Uh, if we have to go away from that, then we'll have to do a major revamp of the technology itself. Uh, net zero emissions by 2001 can be achieved, including the negative emission technologies that, that are introduced, which is BEX, which is bioenergy, carbon capture and storage, and direct air capture, which is uh, which is just removing CO2 from air. Uh, and if you have to differentiate these two technologies, your BEX, which is bioenergy CCS, is a net positive energy solution because you're converting uh, your bio uh, your bio based fuels. Uh, into energy and capturing CO2 from it, whereas direct removal requires needs. It's an energy in. It requires energy input to remove CO2. So these two negative emission technologies differ uh, from each other in that in that aspect. One is a net positive energy solution. The other is a net uh, uh, negative energy solution. With that, I would like to end my talk. I hope I've given uh, a brief introduction to what decarbonizing industry means, uh, a little about what we do and, and what is the way forward. Yeah, thank you then.
if you have any questions i'm willing to take some thank you dr sarik thank you very much for the interesting and informative talk Dr. Sarek has given us insight into the emission of greenhouse gases from industry, whether direct or indirect form, CO2 capture, reduction and removal of greenhouse gases like CO2, methane, and nitrous oxide, decarbonizing industry by car identity, energy analysis. I hope all this information would be helpful for all the participants. I request all the participants to Put their question through that Gmail uh, mail ID, which is shared by Dr. Sarek here. So, should I stop sharing my screen or? Yes, yes, you can stop sharing. Okay. Uh, shall you close the session here? Yeah, if there are any questions, then I um, can take some. There is one question from Jack. Yeah. He has asked yeah, how, how much change in temperature can be linked to water vapor? Uh, Honestly speaking, Jake, uh, I think I cannot answer that question because I do not know. <laughs> uh, but it's an interesting question. I think I'll take a note of this and I'll try to figure out the answer for this. If you could email me, I think we could stay in touch and that would be nice because uh, I do not know the exact number for this. Okay, thank you, sir. I request all the participants to put their question through mail, which is shared by Dr. Sarek. Yeah, thanks, yes. Shall you close the session, sir? It's up to you. Okay. With this note, I would like to close the session here. Our next session, session six, will start from 3 p.m. onwards. So please join us in the next session. There, Professor Abhinas Karutkar will deliver his talk. He is from Water and Land Management Institute, Maharashtra. The talk, title of the talk is Effect of Climate Change on Water Resource Management. I hope it will be helpful for all the participants. So please join us in the next talk. Thank you. Sure. And thank you, Pratik Shavyan, for the invitation. Thanks, Dr. Sir. Welcome. Yeah, to okay. So can I leave the session now or? Yes, yes, you can leave the session. Okay, yeah, thank you.